Hello everyone, welcome to another Sunday live stream. A little bit sunny today, real cold outside, so buckle up, get those water changes going. I know my water changes that are automatically done are actually on pause because it's freezing outside, so I have to go in and kind of do them manually. But yes, yeah, so today I'm taking a question from the chat from before, which if you don't know, about a hundred of us hang out before the live stream goes live for about an hour. We chit chat, people ask questions, maybe it's store related, maybe it's fish health related, maybe it's whatever related, right? Um, so yeah, if you're into that, join us early. You might be listening after the fact, which is totally okay. You might be listening on the podcast, that's okay too. But if you find yourself a little bit extra time on a Sunday like myself, maybe you'll join us. So today's question I'm going to answer is uh, from Catherine. And it's, it's a question slash frustration. And she's been battling some allergy for a long time. And she's ready, says, I'm almost ready to throw in the towel and just stop. At least that tank. And what I, what I wanted to talk about was why. When I go to nature, and let's say I, I'm on a walk or someone's pond or something, and I see a body of water, and I look in, and I see a bunch of algae, I don't instantly start going, ooh, I don't enjoy this. I go and go, ooh, I wonder what's in that algae. I wonder if fish are hiding down there. I wonder what's going on. And so I don't see it as a detriment. But in our aquariums, a lot of times, people will get very upset they've got algae. Now... Sometimes, like you've seen in my videos, like if things get way out of control and you're not having fun, that's not that's not a good thing. But in general, algae is just part of that process. And I like to think of aquariums like we're all kind of going to school and learning about them. Not so much that you maybe come and learn from us on Sunday, but just in general, you're keeping a slice of nature in a box and you want to learn about it. You want to see how they swim, you want to see how they eat, maybe how they breed, how the plants grow how that microorganism has arrived, how this algae is growing, how the algae might go away. And you're on your own path. I think what complicates it for a lot of us is we compete. And this is a non-competitive sport for most of us. There will be some people that put their stuff into competitions, but the vast majority, the 99.9%, .9 will never compete. But they will hold themselves to a standard like they were competing, right? So if I go and I play table tennis tomorrow I know I'm not going to the Olympics but I can still have a ton of fun I know I've got to work on different spins and backhands and things like that and that is why I play to get better it's also why I play with aquariums to get better to learn to go well I wonder if I could breed that fish next I wonder if I try this trick will it beat the algae this time and I understand it's frustrating especially if you don't have a trick to to do for me, at this point, a lot of times when there's an allergy, I've got seven or eight tricks. And yes, I could do this, you know, one that everyone knows, like you'd break down the whole aquarium and, and start it over, right? That's kind of quitting the game and starting a new one. Like, oh, I'm already 10 points behind. Let's just go play a different game. But you don't really learn from that scenario. And so, um, you know, if I'm playing someone better at table tennis and they're, you know, continually beating me, I'm trying more and more and more different strategies. I already know I can't win, but let me try to figure out what's causing them to win. And that's what I do with algae or any illness or anything in an aquarium is, okay, I'm not winning, but I need to start figuring out how it's winning so I can understand the strategy it's using and then I can counteract that. And that, you know, with algae, it might be, oh, we've got too many nutrients going in. Oh, we've got too much blue light in the light. Oh, the light's on too long. There's not enough circulation in the aquarium maybe there's too much debris happening uh sitting on plant leaves maybe it's um you know the we're putting in fertilizer the plants aren't eating it fast enough because the plants are being attacked by fish and so they can't photosynthesize enough there's a million reasons and what i would basically tell Catherine or anybody else don't get caught up so much in i have algae and i'm not enjoying it Try to go, hey, maybe you're taking a different or a difficult course in class somewhere and you just don't get it yet. But you, you've you had, most people have had these moments in their life where 
they're not understanding something and then eventually it's explained in the right way or their brain finally makes a connection like wait had i known that the whole time this was easy you might experience that in math or in you know in uh you know english or or i guess not everyone's taking english so um but in in language class and that kind of stuff and Aquariums are the exact same way, except we're choosing to participate in these experiments. We basically, every time we set up an aquarium, we're going to do an experiment, we're going to see the results, and then maybe we're going to run another experiment. And uh, I think a lot of people get into this hobby not for that. Not that everyone has to like the same thing, but uh, at the end of the day, they're all a bunch of experiments. Every aquascape, even at the highest levels, is let me take all the knowledge I have, put it together, and see if this experiment works out and wins the competition. And so I think a lot of us get held back by what we're seeing in social media, what other people are doing, and not, I guess, lifted up enough by what we've accomplished or what we're doing. You know, we can have tanks that uh, are completely coated in algae, but you might be breeding the rarest fish in the world, and that's viewed as a success, right? But if you're only having... Um, maybe mid-level fish and you have a bunch of algae people only see the algae and you know part of that part of my thing is complimenting other people and everyone's at different stages and so you don't really bad mouth you know if you saw a five-year-old kid and they had a bunch of algae you wouldn't bad mouth them if they were playing table tennis and they just learned how to hit it backhand you wouldn't bad mouth them but somehow um, if now that person is 30 and they've got a bunch of algae, or they just learn to do that backhand, you don't put it in the same light. And I think we we need to because maybe they started playing table tennis yesterday. Maybe they've only had this aquarium for 14 months. Maybe it's their first aquarium. Maybe it's their 100th aquarium, but it's the first time they tried saltwater, or the first time they've tried brackish, or the first planet tank, or the first African cichlid tank, or the first time trying to breed, or the first time keeping crayfish. Every year, I've got first times for me all the time. Um, you know, I'm hoping that this year will be the first time I've ever bred cardinal shrimp. I've kept them. I've got some. I've killed them three times, so I won't be the first. I'm hoping it's not the fourth time I've killed them. Um, but even in 20 years in this hobby, I'm still seeking out new experiences. And with that comes failures. Also comes growth and learning, though. And so we tend to focus on the negative and your hobby might be summed up with, you know, I've got all this algae, I'm not enjoying it, but we're not taking stock in all the things you've learned. You know, maybe this year, year you learned the nitrogen cycle, or maybe you learned a different type of filtration, or maybe you, you know, were in the club and you learned about fish foods or about medicines or something else. And over time, your skills develop. It doesn't mean you're going to be the greatest. I could be the worst table tennis player ever, even after 50 years. But am I enjoying it along the way? That's really what matters in any hobby. And aquariums, for most people, is a hobby. For me, it's a job where, you know, you saw the video. If you watched it yesterday, I'm struggling to make it more of a hobby again. Um, but for most of you guys, it's always a hobby. And so enjoy it as such. If you're really not enjoying it, then, um, you know, maybe it's time for a change. Catherine says, you know, same Catherine. How much algae is too much? Someone asks. Too much algae is when you can't do the things you want. My question would be like, what is it, you know, short of entering into an aquascape, what could algae possibly prevent you from doing? Because I can't think of many things like fish actually do better with algae. Breeding fish is easier. Uh, fish fight less with algae. Water parameters are better because it's constantly cleaning the water. You know, it basically comes down to some aesthetics. And, uh, you know, which is... A definite portion of the hobby for sure. Um, growing plants. You can grow plants perfectly well with algae. And so, but learning the balance and, uh, you know, that's one of the main goals of an aquarium is learning what the fish are going to do, learning the balance of this system, a five gallon versus a 55 versus a 29 versus 180 gallon in your grandma's care versus the 500 gallon at the retirement home versus the nano tank at the barber shop. Um, in fact, I went to a new barber and they had a 75 gallon tank and it uh, could use some love. So I'm going to slowly try and help them 
um, maybe find out what they like because they're not happy with it. And uh, I can see the collection of, of stuff, you know, the remedies they've tried, the, the different things, and, and you, can, you can almost see like a pile of defeat sitting there in cabinets and uh, helping them get the reaction out of their display that they want, you know. And the thing is, this aquarium is, is something that most of us would see and like, wow, someone really needs to kind of dress that thing up, do a thorough gravel vacuuming and clean the filters and do these things. But this is where this person is at. And uh, so in this first haircut I got, I learned the backstory, and I think they've been keeping fish for almost two years now. And they had never kept fish before. One of their people they were cutting hair for, they ended up moving states. And they asked if they wanted these aquariums. And and this woman had said yes. And so that's where they are in this journey. And they learned, they've learned a lot. That's, that's the thing. Is you got to be encouraging when someone learned a lot. And what they inherited was Central and South American cichlids mixed with African cichlids. And, you know... They, they did their research and, oh, these really shouldn't be together. So they bought another tank and they split those up. And so some are at home and some are at the barber shop and, and they're trying their best. They've tried live plants a few times and the African cichlids are being hard on it. And, and, you know, they've got a pleco that's this big in there and, you know, they've got all the, the, the classic things that you run into when you're new to a hob, to a hobby, right? And so hopefully over time, as I'm getting my hair cut once a month, they will ask some questions. I can um, offer up some insight and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to help them out if they want it. I said, hey, you know, if you're interested, I could, I could bring you a light. You know, we, we kind of we kind of make these things and we have a YouTube channel if you're ever interested. And uh, it's also awesome to meet somebody that's in the hobby that has no idea who we are. Because it's uh, interesting to be like, well, we're, you know, so they go to a pet smart or pet co to get their knowledge and their, and their, you know, equipment and stuff like that. So it's kind of interesting to see how that goes for me personally. Um, but hopefully, they will continue in the hobby. That's the main goal. Because I could swoop in, I could put in all of our equipment, I could change it radically, but they might not enjoy that. And part of a hobby is that journey, right? If you're learning to paint, if you want to be an artist. It's way different than if someone just handed you a painting that would sell for $10,000, right? You didn't make it. You don't know how to make it. You don't know how to recreate it, all of that. And so learning that skill and hobbies are just that, learning that skill. And so with learning, there's going to be those paintings you go, well, that one, not so proud of. Um, and there'll be ones you're very proud of, right? And I think... Always starting over, which is one of the most common things I see in the hobby. I see it in our Facebook group. I see it on our forum. I see it lots of places of just starting over. And, you know, if we're painting and you're trying to make a tree plus a house. And every time you make the tree, you don't like the way the tree looks. And you scrap it and you start again. Well, you're never going to develop the skills on painting the house either. So even when you get the tree right, right, we fix the algae. We never got a tank past that point before, and so we've still got so far to go. And sometimes, you know, you'll you'll learn that, like, oh, while painting the house, I learned this trick that made the tree easier. While letting the tank mature, and I worked on breeding the fish, turns out that nature solved my algae problem. You know, algae in itself fixes itself if you let a tank go long enough. Most people don't, and... That's, you know, one of those things that patience is a very hard thing to teach and learn. But most allergies will get horrible, 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 and then crash because they won't have enough nutrient input or, you know, the light will degrade over time, which they do. Something will happen where it finally balances out. And the reset all the time, though, a lot of times people get to the same point of like, yep, every three months I get algae. It's like, well, yeah. From three to like three months to nine months, that's the algae zone. And we've done videos and things on that where you'll fight these different algaes, and that's a normal part of a planted tank, learning the balance, learning the lighting, learning the fertilizer, all of these things. And then part of it is learning. The other part is, uh, you know, just letting chemical reactions happen and things stabilize. And, you know, if you have 
uh, gravel, right? Well, you put root tabs in it, but a year later, right? A year later, you've got all the fish poop to supplement that. And that's a different level of feeding the roots than um, just putting root tabs and fertilizer. So things take time to mature. And, uh, you know, my, my biggest advice is if you're not enjoying it, well, then you do need to stop because if you're not, if you're not enjoying it, that's, that's a problem. But if you're enjoying it, but you're frustrated, take stock and what have you been successful with? What could you work on that you'd be having fun with? You know, what's the next thing you're going to try and keep going forward with it? Because that, that's where you're going to get those breakthroughs. So, all right. People are talking about Aquashella. Yep, there's two dates that have been announced. Um, I think one's in Texas and one will be in Florida. I think it's, um, is it? I want to say I want to say Dayton, but it's not Dayton. Somewhere somewhere else in Florida. I don't think it's Orlando. Um, Aquarium Co-op will not be attending either of them, and it's mostly just because we've got stuff to focus on. We got a retail store to finish building. We've got some products we got to keep working on. I've got family that I gotta you know my grandmother and things, and there's stuff I want to work on, and so um, we're committing to no travel. And uh, you know there's plenty of how can we make it work? And we've, we've had meetings and, and I just, you know, I, I basically made a video and said, I can't, I can't do it. You know, my grandmother has been diagnosed with early onset dementia and we visit her every Sunday and she forgets more and more each Sunday. It's progressing that quick. And, uh, so I want to limit the time away that we are from home as much as we can. And we have other family, we're doing a trip to visit some other family because on my wife's side, they're getting quite old, and uh, we haven't visited them in t or 10 years. And so it's mostly focusing on my fish room, products, store expansion, and family this year. And so we won't be doing any traveling, which I'm sure will be uh, sad for some people, but everyone can understand, I'm sure. And uh, so by all means, go to the shows, have a great time, uh, let us know how they are. Uh, I don't know who's speaking or anything like that yet, so... You know, more to come on that, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, we don't know where we'll be. Maybe next year we're all in again. It just depends on how things shake out and how, um, you know, how this year goes. So that's where we're at with that. Just want everybody to know so that way they're not, uh, you know, upset if they plan a vacation or something expecting to see us there and we won't be this year. So... A store carries your products that's three miles from me. I got the big thing of brine shrimp eggs and a five-minute drive. Nice. Yeah, I put up these products. These are the products I kind of had laying around in the studio as I've been cleaning it up, as you guys had seen. And, uh, you know, I don't have the angle right or anything yet. And there's glare. and and But you can see new products like the, the totes, these totes. That's the insulated tote. And... Uh, you know, so what I, I like to see sometimes is like I found a treasure, like a really old Easy Green bottle while cleaning, and uh, I, I'm I'm starting to lose some of the things we've done, like the first shirt we ever did. I think I only have one copy left, and things like that. So I want to start putting some stuff mostly on a shelf to forget about. So in ten or fifteen years, like oh yeah, I forgot we used to do that. Like that's changed so much in the years. Uh, let's see here. Can you give me some tips on the store Facebook page I solely run? I want our store to be the more, to be more according co-op like, as I agree with your mantra. Um, I see. There's there's not really many tips. The tip is. Spend as much time as you can with the customers. And people a lot of time are like, okay, yeah, but yeah, but how do I how do I growth hack that? How do I, you know, how are they gonna phrase it? You know, if you're the younger crowd will say growth hack, the older people will be like, that's not sustainable. And the the simplest thing is just spend time. 
that's the only thing that matters. So when you have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a customer or a potential customer, that's what you need to do. And I, I do it all day, not all day long, but I do it every day. The first thing I do when I wake up, answer comments on YouTube, answer comments on Facebook, answer comments on the forum, you know, check out Instagram. And I'm not answering every comment, but I'm spending my time picking and choosing and interacting. Ooh, that person's brand new to the hobby. Ooh, this person had a really meaningful com comment. Uh, you know, check on our ads, all of these things. Then you have breakfast. Then you do it again. Then you check your emails. Then you do it again. Then you make some content. Then you do it again. And, uh, you know, if, you, if you're really following Johnny, if you're following the Facebook group, the page, the Instagram, my personal Instagram, my personal Facebook, you'll see that like most days, every few hours, there's just more information coming at people who want it, right? And yeah, there are other aspects that get helped, right? We have Zenzo and Irene and Jimmy and Candy and, and lots of employees. And there's newsletters and there's all these things. But even from the owner, where I still have work, I try to update the people that want to be updated about what I am doing and my company is doing as often as I can and share. So yesterday, you know, like the members learned that I proofed the 16-inch light. I put a recliner in my fish room. I looked at the sunset. Um, I posted a little bit of that to the Facebook group. Uh, what else? I was I read through the reviews again because we had gotten more reviews on our light, which was good. I wanted to make sure that I'm staying up to date and learning about the feedback from the lights. And then I thanked people and I posted it on Facebook. I said, hey, thank you. I actually have read these and I will continue to read these. And uh, that's the only thing that matters is spending time. And people are going to say, well, what about making money? What about doing the right thing by the customer? What about, what about, what about? Those are all valid things too, but if you're actually spending time with the customer, you're going to know those things come with that. There was a, a person in the chat who had just bought a used 75-gallon display. It was the biggest tank. They'd been saving up for it, right? And uh, when they got it home, they realized the bottom brace is cracked. And uh, when they bought it from the store, it was sold as is. Now, they, I, they haven't talked to the store yet, so maybe the store is going to make it right, and hopefully they will. But in my opinion, that becomes a no-brainer. And what what is a no-brainer? No-brainer means you don't even need to think about it. If a customer was to come back in and we had sold a used setup, which we don't and would never because of things like this, you learn. We would make it right and we go, well, oof, is there a solution that makes sense? Can we order up a new 75-gallon and replace it and not lose money? Could we offer X amount of money back? Because, you know, I don't know what the, you know, maybe it's got stand, canopy, and light, filter. I, I don't know what this package looked like. Um, but what we know is spending time with people, and I love to spend time analyzing people. Not, not so much, I'm an introvert, and I don't really like spending time with people, as in, let's go out. I, I like to study people and to see what they're doing and how they interact. But what I will know is a bad experience like that. So imagine you saved up for a year. And you went and spent all your money at a store. And then you instantly learn that that money is now useless and you've wasted a year of your life. Do you think the, the person that bought that will be happy to do that again at that store? Highly unlikely, right? And so I know as a business person, they might tell other people, which now we have a whole, we have a whole, you know, 800 of us right now that know this story. We have no idea what store or anything, and they haven't had a chance. Maybe they're going to make it right. Maybe they're going to, you know, make it's the best outcome we've ever heard, right? Just using this as an example. But by spending time, you'll know these things. You'll know the inner workings of this, and you'll see the value. Like what people don't realize, one of the reasons we have the best customer service is because I learned early on I can pay to get someone's attention or I can make things right very easily when something goes wrong, and I will also get that attention. That's earned attention. So when that 75-gallon tank goes wrong and the customer comes in and they go, oh, man, this is horrible. I don't know what I'm going to do, and they make it right, and then that person comes in the live stream next week and they go, XYZ Aquariums 
made it right, Corey. Oh my gosh, so good. I've got my new favorite fish store, and I read that name out, and now someone else goes, well, I live in that state too, and that's a great thing, and I'm going to go by there. That comes from doing the right thing. Now, you can do the wrong thing. Well, I shouldn't say it's wrong, because there sometimes, you know, it's like sign on the dotted line. I, I pointed it out to you, all of that, but you can do the opposite of not making it right in the customer's eyes. And instead, they tell 10 people that, you know, that's what happened. That's not great. I wouldn't slam uh, an independent store online, at least not knowingly and uh, intentionally. It does happen when I'm on a, on a rant. But then they have to use that money that would have bought that aquarium, basically, and advertise to get the next customer. And uh, so, yes, the, the thing that matters the most in anything you're doing is time. It's the only thing that is the limited resources in our lives. You can get more money. You can't get more time, right? We've all got the same amount of time. You can hire more people. That's a way to kind of hack the time a little bit. But, you know, with a million options available at any point, if I wanted to go buy a product, there's probably 10,000 different stores that sell that. The only thing that really matters anymore is customer service and the attention of the people that are selling it to you. You feel a lot better. It's the reason why Costco and Apple and a bunch of other companies win. And it's why Amazon used to win and is starting to not win as much because they've lost focus of the customer and the customer experience. That's the only thing that actually matters. People are willing to pay more. It happens all the time on Amazon. You will go pay more because you trust Amazon would do the right thing and get it to you faster than random company you've never heard. But as those things and reviews become less trustworthy and stuff on Amazon, as those things start to dwindle, our sentiment about things changes. And so your goal running any business is be with the customers, learn from them, make them feel valued because they are valued, and you will, you will make some headway right? Even if you never learn how to develop a product or do any of these things, you still will put yourself to the top of the pile in any industry. If you're making water bottles and the CEO, maybe you don't, maybe you just like you rebrand a water bottle and you just put your name on it. The fact that you're there every day, seven days a week, spending three hours just answering comments, asking them how they liked it, you know, asking them for testimonials, all of that will just outcompete the 50,000 other brands of water bottles that aren't doing that. So that's the, the easiest thing. As in, you don't need technical knowledge. You don't need many resources. You need a phone. is basically what you got to do to pull it off. So it's not easy in the giving up your time, but it's not difficult to figure it out. And, uh, you know, that's not the answers that people want to hear in business because they want to hack. They, well, how can I... You know, how can I get the result without doing that? Because we all know what business is. Provide a service or a product in a meaningful way to the customer. Do right by them and they'll buy again. It's not some magical formula. Everybody knows it. It's deploying all of those things and actually doing it. And people try to compete too hard. You know, if I sell this water bottle for a dollar and then... Five years in, there's manufacturing defects where we ordered 100,000 bottles and they all crack at, at month eight. I can't afford to replace them, right? And because my competitor was selling it for a dollar, but my competitor doesn't care. They'll just rebrand themselves next week, right? Because they're selling on water bottles that are a dollar and not on one that's got a warranty for X amount of years and, you know, guaranteed to be this and that. So... All right. Have I been to any of the expos in Las Vegas? I have. Yeah, I go to... Oh, right. well, I shouldn't say I go to. I have been to Super Zoo a few times, which is one for kind of store owners and industry people. But I haven't been to any, like... Uh, I'm not sure that there are um, any shows for consumers. You've got this water bottle and the cap keeps falling off. I've got like four of these. Never had a problem yet. In fact, I bought... Like Katie Tropicals and stuff, some too. I send them to people because I love this one, actually. Tested quite a few. I mean, I wouldn't bet my life on it, but so far as the winner.
Okie dokie. Uh, does water hardness affect the nitrifying bacteria? I don't know that answer. I'm sure there's an optimal water parameters for nitrifying bacteria. That being said, I don't know how much it matters, right? So imagine the perfect one, maybe you grow, you know, bacteria and it doubles every 24 hours or 16 hours. And the worst possible, not the worst possible, but like normal aquarium water that was not ideal for it, but maybe it's, oh, it's seven, it's one more hour, right? I don't know how much of a difference will be there. Could be huge also, could be radically different. Um, but I don't know, I don't know those um, studies or anything. So, yeah. <laughs> Costco big with threaten to fire someone if they raise the price of their hot dogs. Yeah, that's, I mean, I don't threaten to fire people, but I do put my foot down every once in a while. It's like, we're not doing it because I get to own the company. So that's a good thing. But there, every, you know, probably like once a year, there'll be a big disagreement between a lot of employees or mines and me. And then I just have to pull out like the, I own the company card. And I go, the reason we are or aren't doing this is purely because I say so. And I don't have to explain myself why. It's, you know, I'm willing to bet my future on it, which you guys and girls bet your future on me, um, you know, by working for me. But, you know, there, there are times when there are disagreements. And, there you know, it's usually when there's no clear path, you know, and we have to make a gut decision. And that's where the biggest... Um, you know, fork in the road happens. So, but it's not very often. So we were a pretty well-oiled team. I set up two 10 watt LED floodlights in my 26 gallon. It's really bright. Is that going to give me a lot of algae? Uh, it might, if you're not, usually with a lot of light, you want CO2 injection and a lot of fertilizer. Um, the other things you could try doing is getting some light diffuser paper use it in like photography and stuff, or you could try and get like some screen material and that might dim it down some, but you know, there's a, there's a billion lights out there and usually you can make almost any light work with enough of your time and money and energy invested, right? So what the difference becomes between like maybe those lights and our lights, our lights would probably cost you more money right at the get go, but they're just going to work where that one's going to be cheaper at the get-go, but then how much time and energy gets used to dial it in to get the result you want. And uh, for some people, they save a ton of money because they're like, oh, I'm just doing my own thing. I'm enjoying the journey, and I have 100 tanks, and I'm, it's going to scale once I figure it out. Some people only have one tank, and maybe they're a doctor or a lawyer or, uh, you know, uh, they take care of 10 kids or five kids or two kids or whatever, and they're just really busy, like, Everyone's got a different value analysis on everything. So, um, but yes, the floodlights in general can definitely grow lights. I find for me personally, the ones that I've used is that uh, I find them to be a little too, too yellow, which our light is, is fairly yellow. I like the sunlight look, but it's, it's not that it's not balanced out enough for my visual preference. Are a few gyms worth the effort? Uh, in my opinion, no. But with the caveat that essentially every aquarium I own is a refugium. It's just plants. It's a it's an ecosystem, and so refugiums mostly are. Am I gonna hang a miniature ecosystem off the back of my aquarium? Is that worth it? In some situations, potentially. In the way I run my aquariums, no, that's just making, you know, that's just making it harder. That's like saying, should I have my morning cereal with chopsticks? Like, it's not that it can't be done. It's just why, you know, like even even a fork is gonna be more efficient than the chopsticks. And you're like on a, you're gonna be on a time limit. It's getting mushy. Oh no. 
Uh, let's see here. Uh, dang it, I read a question that I wanted to uh, answer, but I can't find it now. Oh, where did I get the floating turtle basking dock I found, you saw in the video from yesterday? I'm sure Amazon. I think it's a, maybe a ZooMed product. Um, yeah, it had magnets and the magnets weren't very good. And so I lost those like a fish room and a half ago. And so it just floats, which it's not their favorite, but my tiny turtles can still use it. Whereas like a big painted turtle or rendered slider or something like that, it's going to be way too unstable for them. Does the co-op sell any books? We don't. Um, well, I shouldn't say we don't. We usually only partake in limited run stuff. We have in the past a magazine slash books. We will in the future. Someone had asked about the Oliver Knott book. When will it be here? That answer is when it gets here. Importing a book and keeping it affordable. It's going to take time. It's going to go on a slow boat. And uh, we've never imported. Well, that's not true. That's that actually. We have never been the importers of a book. We've bought books that have been imported. So, you know, it means we got to look up the correct codes and the correct procedures to get a book to come over which it's not crazy difficult. It's just we don't have, like, bring a sponge filter over. Like, oh, we already do that. It's this code and this and that. Um, so, yeah, that's... But in general, books aren't profitable. And this is actually... I'll be honest. This is actually one of the things where I put my foot down. And I just said, we're just going to sell Oliver Knott's book. You know, because the internal teams look at it and they're like, it's not profitable. We don't make any money. Like, we got to change our packaging it's a nightmare to go, oh, someone ordered a book into Anubius and that's going to be bad, you know, and I go, great, except this is a book that I think is good and people ask for books all the time. We don't necessarily, it's not that we won't make any money on it. It's that the amount of changes in operation and everything that's going to go on to sell 400 books, because there's only 400, won't, like of the things that get done this year, right? It's going to be one of those like, man, that was really low on the list. Why did we put it at the top and get it done? And it's like, well, because I said we were going to. And so, um, but that's one of the reasons why we don't sell tons of books is in general, they're not a great thing to be mixing in with plants and other stuff. And it's it's just it's just wetness and, and all of those things and, and books are handled by stores and things that sell books better. You know, there is, in shipping even, there's a book rate where you can ship ultra slow and cheap. But that works really well when you're only shipping books. The minute you're buying plants and other stuff, and we're known for our fast shipping, and we don't want to disappoint our customer, we know that we still have to ship this awkward size book quickly to maintain our reputation. And so that's where it becomes this thing that, I'm sure we'll make a few dollars on it. Um, and in fact, everything that we make, we're splitting 50-50 with uh, Oliver Knott. So after shipping and that, it's all being um, shared. So, But it's mostly because I wanted to just get that done. I think it's going to be for the 400 people that get one. In fact, I, I didn't. we haven't come up with the prize yet. Um, I, I still have to even see if it's legal for us to do it in the U.S., but... Um, Oliver told me after the fact that there's five books that he drew a unique fish in each one. And, uh, he's like, I would love to have the people that buy those books and they go out at random, get like a special prize. And I said, Hey, that's a great idea. Um, good thinking. And so they're kind of funny, cool cartoon fish that he drew. And, uh, there's five of them out of the 400. And so we'll see if we can do that. Or, if, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to accidentally be like, you're gambling. Like, well, that's not what I'm trying to do either. And te internal teams have questions like, are we limiting how many people can buy? Because we don't want a reseller thing. Like, I, that's something I don't like. And uh, I think most of us don't like, oh, someone bought 80 of the books. Now they went out of stock. Now they're selling them for five times the price. You know, we want to, I think we're, we're considering limiting it to two so that you could buy one for you and like one for a friend or something like that at most. Um because we, we don't have, like 400 seems like a lot, but it's knowing that that's all there is, right? There's no more that just, you know, and they were printed a long time ago. So it's kind of like Oliver not actually gave me one and I, and that's why I read it and everything. And I was 
to learn that he actually had more, and they were just kind of sitting in a pallet way in a publishing house. And uh, so, yeah, it's kind of, you know, from the vault type of thing. Like, hey, there's not going to be more of these. It's kind of what it is. What kind of sand do I use in Ladybird's Aquarium? I use uh, Semex 0.8 Lapis Luster Sand. Any tricks or tips on feeding bulk flat packs of frozen food? Little blister packs are convenient, but getting expensive. Not really. I mean, the way Dean does it is he's got a, a cutting board dedicated to, um, you know, like blood frozen foods. And he just uh, chops it up with a big knife, you know, and, and makes the cubes and it, of the day, right? Because if you've got a big fish room, you're, you're feeding kind of a decent amount and not just like one little sliver. But, you know, if you know you feed this much of a flat pack, you kind of cut that off and cut it into some chunks, and now you've got some pieces to feed out. But, yes, I mean, that's that's another great example of flat pack versus the convenience of blister packs. And what I would, what I would probably encourage you is wherever you're buying those in person, if you buy them in large enough quantities, they get fairly similar, right? And so we have, like like myself and Dean and, and that kind of stuff, we might go like, oh yeah, I'm going to need 48 blister packs of blood worms. I'm going to need the same in brine shrimp. I'm going to need the same in cyclops. I'm going to need the... And so we might have an $800 food bill, but it might have been 1200 had we not bought it $800 at a time. You see what I'm saying? So if you just buy like, oh, I buy two packs of frozen food every week, where when you go to a store and you go, hey, I'd like to buy X, could you order that in? I'll pick it up the day it comes in because I know you don't have as much freezer space or whatever. You're likely to get fairly similar. And Dean gets blister packs from us in addition to flat packs because when he's out of town, the person watches his fish room. It's way easier to put a number and go, hey, it's three blood worms, two brine shrimp, one baby brine shrimp, one cyclops, instead of trying to go, hey, you cut them up into these sizes and then you would feed appropriately. And he, you know, he has different people feed sometimes. So sometimes if he's out of town for a few weeks, you know, maybe his wife's feeding for a week and then maybe she's joining him and then someone else feeding for a week and then maybe it's his daughter. And so when you have a few people doing things like that, you want to standardize it. And that's why we feed a lot of cubed stuff at the store, standardizing it for all the different employees instead of, well, my breaking a piece off of the blood worms is much different than this person. Do I have any tips on triggering spotted Congo puppers to spawn? My pair hasn't spawned for months, and the female is very round. I don't. Uh, I haven't bred them, so I don't really have good tips. But in general, look at the water, you know, and temperature and things like that. And uh, they usually produce pretty regularly, though, for the people that get them going. Dean got them going. I visited people that are really cranking them out, and they're kind of like clockwork once a week. So something tells me either A, there's physically something wrong with the fish, maybe it's egg bound, maybe it's got a you know, liver's failing, maybe it's it hates its mate, whatever it is, or usually more commonly it's something about the setup in the water of it's just not happy enough. If the temperature screen on the aquarium co-op heater is cracked, could that cause stray current? I suppose so. I suppose anything could. Um yeah, I would I would tell you reach out to us. We'll send you a new one. It might be fully fine, but why take the chance if it's within the warranty period? Mm. If you know, well, I want I want to follow up on that. Most things I would just use it, but on something like that, when a heater does fail, it can be so catastrophic. I wouldn't take the chance. But like, if this water bottle had like, oh, it's got a little bit of a crack or a mark here but no water was I would just use it I wouldn't be like I better get a new one um, but something I'm trying to think of something that could be catastrophic enough like let's say my toilet had a crack <coughs> I wouldn't want that to like break and leak water and ruin my house while I'm out of town so I would replace that okie doke do I ship plants now? Yes. It's 15 degrees in Kansas. Uh, I need very easy plants. Can you recommend a few? 
We've got plenty of videos on that. Every plant on our website says how difficult it is. Uh, yes, we do ship. We have liners. We have heat packs. Things like Anubias, Cryptocorns. But 80% of the plants on our website are considered to be very easy. Um, that being said, people kill very easy plants all the time. You know, you buy that spider plant or that pothos in your house and you forget to water a little too much and oops, there it went. And the same thing can happen in an aquarium. <clears throat> so even though it's easy, it doesn't mean it'll be easy for you. And what's easy for someone else can be very difficult for someone else based on water parameters and stuff like that. But yeah, in general, we sell mostly easy plants. And that's that's kind of our thing. If you, if you haven't noticed yet, easy green, easy plant LED, easy root tabs, easy. Like we're, we're making it as easy as possible and we curate the selection of everything to, you know, based on studying people, pulling, you know, items off our website and putting them together and having them work is what we're trying to do. Not so much like, well, I see you have nine different lights. Which one should I buy? I see you have... 17 different dechlorinators which one like just trying to condense it down to like we have one the one that is going to work and we trust and we use pick that one obviously customer satisfaction is the main thing but what do you do when a customer comes up to you three times a week at roughly four hours at a time do what you would do and just you help them and you develop skills on how to move them along like the like this is too much into the business part of like well what's the training you have in place for yourself and your employees on how to identify customer needs and fulfill those needs in fast but meaningful ways what are the ways you've developed in which if someone just wants to hang out to delicately say hey you know I've got another project I need to be working on and things like that it happens in every industry. Um, yeah, that's, you know, part of that, like we, I do make videos and I haven't made a video on that, but we do make videos on how to educate and train uh, stores for our retail partner program. And, uh, you know, there's, there's tactics and things you can do to mitigate that, right? But Usually when you analyze that, there's something wrong in 12 hours a week. Either someone hasn't fully explained the relationship that's supposed to be there, or B, they're spending enough money that it warrants 12 hours a week, or, you know, there's always a reason, and, uh, you know, you just got to get through to the other side of it. Every once in a while, sure, maybe there's someone with a, you know, a, a reason... But that shouldn't, it should be the minority and not the norm. Uh, let's see. I just want to say I have a 40 inch Hyger light and the new co op light. Same length, the Hyger light is extremely hot. Even at 60%, your light is cool to the touch. I love it. Yeah. I mean, I could go on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break it down. There's a lot of people that are going to sell a lot of products over the next 50 years and the past 50 years. I spend all of my time studying people and aquariums. To a point, it's detrimental to my family and marriage and my health and everything. Like, I literally laser focus to, like, a rain man status on stuff that nobody cares about. And then I put all of that into designing our products. And so most manufacturers would say that the temperature of the light doesn't even matter. They would say, you know, whether it's waterproof wouldn't matter. A lot of these things. And they're just out of touch with, I think, the actual hobby. And so, yes, in my mind, when you actually use lights, you know you don't want them to be hot. Your arms get burned or at least warm enough you've seen lights that are out there in the industry burn people's carpets you've seen influencers with contracts signed where they can't announce how it was you know they walked into their home and their home was filled with smoke because of the light but they signed 
a contract that said they couldn't disparage the company and let people know. Like, you you see and know these things, and so you, you really see how important it is, and then you see the companies continue to sell the light because, just like me, well, I'm $200,000 into it. If we don't, the company goes out of business, right? And so when, you, when, I, when I've seen these things, uh, you know, I look at it and I go, well, how do I prevent that? Well, one of it is don't take on debt to do it. Another thing is don't rush to do things. Like we could have launched a light probably eight years ago, right? But instead we kind of kept looking for what light are we going to launch? Let's test it. Let's change things. Let's do these things. And uh, we get to a point where we're really proud of something. We think it's safe. We, we really were willing to put our business behind in our livelihoods. And there's a lot of companies out there that, uh, you know, they're, they're not putting their livelihood on the line. It's just, you know, like I'm not, I'm only bringing up Higer here because they're the ones that were brought up. But last time I looked at Amazon, they are selling 46 different lights, not, not sizes, I'm saying 46 different lights. There's no way they tested them all in a meaningful way, right? There's no way they're actively working on improving them all. There's just, they're not, it's not the same experience. And, uh, you know, I I think most of the people that buy from us, they, they realize that. Thankful for that. We get it. But there's a lot of people that are new to the hobby. They don't, there's like a light. They're like, it's $11. Why wouldn't I buy it? Right? It's kind of like buying a, uh, you know, let's say you're going to buy, you go to a restaurant and you sit down and you're going to have a steak and they go, that'll be a dollar twelve. You're instantly going, a dollar twelve? Is it on sale today? Oh, every day your little price, it's a dollar twelve. You're instantly like, what? There's no way. And so, you know, to get to a dollar twelve steak, some corners had to been cut, right? And we're not willing to cut corners. Instead, we're willing to make choices. We're willing to spend money. We're willing to go against the grain. We're willing to spend time. So often companies, um, they just want to throw their name on it. And it's not that we don't do that too. We, we definitely, one of, our, one of my strengths is finding a product like, hey, that's pretty good. Now if you just change these four things, it's great. But that's most of what the world is today, right? There's a billion water bottles. What makes this one good? Like, well, I like that it didn't have the straw. I'm, I'm not a fan of the straw. I like the flip top. I like the fact that it won't leak, right? Because it's got the little replaceable silicone parts right here. The fact that when you put it through the dishwasher, you can take off the little the little uh, hand thingy, the, the wristlet, if you will. I like the fact that it has the wristlet because too often I'm getting out of my car and you've got, oh, you've got an aquarium product, you've got this, you've got something else, you just like wrap around, you grab the stuff, right? That's all the difference in uh, most products. Every once in a while there's a revolutionary thing that never existed before. But the difference between uh, a floodlight, a car, a headlight, a hydroponic light, a saltwater light and the aquarium co-op light, there's less things different than there are similar. And so those tweaks are what it really matters. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like cell phones, right? Most cell phones on the basis that are like, oh, you can make a call, you can text, you can use the internet. But yet we're all really campy and, oh, I'm only iPhone. Oh, I'm only, like, I really I love iPhone mini compared. And then my wife loves the Max. And then, you know, the next person's a Samsung person. The next person's an LG person. and But really, they're all the same thing, if we're being honest. They're slightly different prices, slightly different warranties, slightly different capabilities. But really, if you needed any of them in a time of crisis, you'd be happy to have it. Is it okay to ask personal questions in this chat? Yeah, I mean, I'm usually pretty uh, pretty open for most things. Uh, let's see here. 
I have a 24-7 Hyger light that stays cool, so when it finally stops working, I'll buy an Accordion Coil light. Sure, if it makes sense. Yeah. Why not? I mean, I've tested a lot of lights. And in fact, I ordered another light today to test just to, to see, because I know eventually someone's going to ask me about that light. And I want to be able to go, hey, I've held it in my hand. I turned it on. I played with it. Um, but it's all a bunch of preferences. And, you know, we don't all have to have the same. A few live streams ago, I... T I ah, a few live streams ago, I said I told my local fish store owner... Name your price for a large Java fern rock. And I took your advice and left my number. I think he watched the stream because he called back. All right. Yeah. I mean, just like Johnny's been asking, there's, there's customers that come in and spend a lot of time and, and, and this and that. And we all have to make decisions. And too often, there'll be something in the store that everyone asks. How much is Murphy? How much is that thing? How much is that thing? And on the average, most of them just want to ask or they only were going to buy it if it was that $1.12 steak of like, wait, it's way too cheap. And then when you kind of go like, well, you know, the amount of money we've invested in Murphy to like feed him and stuff like that. Like if you even if he wasn't a mascot, you're like, I'm into him for at least five grand in food. What? I would never pay that. Like, great, because he's not for sale. It says it right there on the tank. You know, and same thing with, you know, that Java Fern. It's a magnificent piece. And most people might, how much for that Java Fern? Oh, man, yeah. Oh, okay. I just, you know, if it was it was like $30, I'd have bought it, right? But it might have taken time and energy. And maybe this person values it at $400. And things that have been created are like art. Some might say, hey, that art right there is worth a million dollars. The next person goes, I wouldn't pay a, I wouldn't hang it up in here for free. I don't like it. Right? But sometimes they align. And you might go, you know, they might go, it's 400 bucks. And you're like, oh, dang. I, you know, I've been saving up because I really love that piece, but it's only 350 And it might, you know, maybe the owner's like me, or maybe you'll run into a situation like this. Like a lot of times when I find someone that actually cares as much as I do about a thing, I make it like, how about this? How about 200 bucks? Because now I've realized they actually love it as much as I do. And if I'm the, the artist that made it, I could make another one, right? Time, energy. But in a store, you get that question a thousand times a day. Hey, that really cool thing that you did, could I get that for next to nothing? No, sorry, it's not for sale. Do you guys take plant walk-ins? I really need to ditch a giant Anubius Nana. Uh, yeah. I don't know exactly what our process looks like today. A lot of times you'd be like, hey, you know, you want like a fish for it, maybe some food, but it would purely depend. You know, if you walk in in the middle of a Saturday when we're hopping, it's costing us money to even like what is in this bag. So we probably won't offer much. If it's, you know, Tuesday at 5 p.m. and we're, you know, slow because people are at dinner. All right. Yeah. What do you got? Oh, great. Doesn't have allergy. Everything looks healthy. Do I have somewhere to put it right now? All right. Yeah. You want, you know, I'll give you X. X uh, sort of credit for it. But I'm not in the store today doing that. And there's always timing, right? Because sometimes you're like, yeah, if someone just did that to us, we've got a bunch of big ones. So. You're doing an awesome job at introducing us to important names in the hobby with the members only streams. Who else should we know? that you can't get? Hmm. That's a question I probably would have to think about. Luckily enough, most people say yes. It's mostly a timing thing. Um, and there's people we just haven't reached out to yet, potentially. It, it really depends on what's the subject. Like if you're really into, um, you know, African cichlids, like Ed Konings is worth seeing speak a few times on a few different topics. One that's super nerdy that... I don't think a lot of people would really love unless you're really into it would be um, I think Jennifer Reynolds. She used to work at the Vancouver Aquarium and she's got two talks, one on stingrays, which I wasn't as big of a fan of, but one where she spent, I want to say it's like over a year um, studying Neolamprologus burchardi in the wild to just learn how their harem style worked. And it was fascinating and different than anyone had ever seen before. 
And that's why I got studied for so long. But it really only matters if you've ever like kept that fish, want to keep that fish or bred that fish. And so, you know, but over time, we're just going to keep going, hey, yeah, I think they've got something good to say. Let's uh, keep providing that value. And uh, yeah, I was reading a comment that just these comments always blow my like make my mind. It's like, huh, Corey, why don't you keep Machiensis bettas in a display tank? And my brain instantly just goes, well, if I have 25 tanks and there's a few thousand species that I'd like to keep at least, the answer is simple. I can only keep 25 out of, let's say, 3,000 that I like at any one time. The odds are I won't have a beta machiensis tank. Do I unplug a fully submerged heater before putting hands in the aquarium to clean? Uh, I'm sure I'm probably supposed to um, say yes, but the reality is we never do in a store setting or at home. I actually set up my, my buildings and stuff to have GFIs and everything so that if there was to be a problem with a heater like that, and you were to start getting shocked, it would trip the circuit. I encourage everybody to do that at, at home as well. You can buy things as simple as, like when I was in the maintenance business and I didn't have the authority to be like, you need to get an electrician, upgrade your system to be safer for myself and for your home. We would buy like $35, um, I say we, I would, uh, I'm going to call it an extension cord. I don't think that's the right word for it, but basically it's a GFI. Let me see if I can find like a, what I'm trying to say here and just link it. Uh, GFI uh, cord, maybe? Cord? Yeah, here's, here's a great example of something that I would use. I'm going to link it in chat here, and it they're officially calling it a GFCI extension cord for outdoor use and it's got you know the reset button and the test and everything on it and you would plug in what I would do is I would plug in let's see if that'll work for everybody I would plug in the power strip that I'm plugging pumps and stuff like that into and I really would be a stickler for it when I was working with saltwater aquarium saltwater with the saltwater creep and stuff that happens much more likely to actually I I, I guess I should do some videos and stuff like that maybe one day, but, you know, tales from being a, a, a maintenance guy when I ran my own maintenance business, you'd get called out, and I remember at least twice I got called out, and they just like, oh, the other person stopped coming, they weren't very good, whatever, for like these saltwater tanks, and I'd get in there, and I'd start cleaning, and saltwater creep would be everywhere, I'd be like, this is a train wreck, and you would see that they've actually had fires before. You know, and I'm like, did you know that the thing has been melting down? And, oh, I didn't know that. You know, and I'm like, you're supposed to be on a GFCI. Like, that's the first thing I'd be starting. You need to, you know, people don't have drip loops all the time. I see this all the time in aquariums, and I'm just like, yeah, this is just, you're just asking for it. And so I'd have to start mounting power strips, uh, you know, upside down underneath so they're to create drip loops. And especially with, you know, freshwater, saltwater, and you start having sumps and all of these, all of these things with equipment. And I, I get it. It's, oh, I got a new thing. I'm excited. Let me plug that in. And I, I've got this scenario going on a little bit in my own, in my own like 800 gallon. It is off the floor and everything, but really I need to spend the time and I haven't because I need to go buy three quarter inch screws so that I can take these power strips, put them underneath the tank because I have plywood, one inch plywood, and just tack it up so I make nice drip loops. There are drip loops, but they're not as nice as I would like. And, uh, but yeah, the amount of times where I've seen burn marks and scorch marks and like exposed wires and cuts and and stuff in uh, people's equipment, really you should you should use and have stuff on a GFCI, especially the more you get into that hobby, right? The more you've got more tanks, you know, if the odds are one in a thousand or, you know, you pick a number. Oh, well, if I've won a quarry a thousand times, if I put my hand in there once a week, it's like, oh, it'd take years before I might have a problem. 
you start going to like, oh, I have 25 tanks and I'm putting my hand in each one of those once a week. Like, well, that starts coming down to months. And, uh, you know, I worked for a fish store and, and routinely I'd get shocked probably once a month, every two months. And it was the classic old crusty fish store where everything's daisy chain, just one, you know, one extension cord and power strip into another one, into another one, and, and kind of just like draped over stuff and they'd get wet and, and there was metal stands. And that's one of the reasons I like to use, I prefer to use wood because if there is any contact somehow, um, you know, you, you get things where like a, a cord, a, a heater cord gets pinched between a tank and a piece of metal when you're setting the tank up or moving it or whatever in a fish door. And then pretty soon that's a bare wire. And then you have like your arm, you're catching a fish or something, you're holding a metal net, right? You're holding a metal net, your elbow's making contact with the, the metal stand and like the tip of your fingers touch the water. Oh, geez. And your, your, you know, your arm is tense up because it gets that electrical shock. You know, so there's, there's methods to my madness on why our nets are like, oh, it's carbon fiber and not metal. And these are all little nuances from, you know, like, oh, that was five years where I got shocked like once. And the thing is, you would start replacing heaters and that costs the company money. And you replace, like, I think it was this tank. And when you have a metal stand, and let's say you have 20 aquariums on it. It could be the bottom right one that has actually got the heater that's causing the stand to become charged. But it's a needle in a haystack to replace them and figure it out. And it's impossible to kind of convince your store owner to go like, we should spend at $30 a heater, we should spend $600 so I don't get shocked. Instead, like, well, let me, we'll try this one. Or we'll swap it out. Or we'll unplug it. Or we'll do this. And so, yeah, it was... Yeah, I was gonna say it was a good time. It wasn't good times. It 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 honestly kind of sucked. Are the air pumps coming back? Yes, they will be coming back. Uh, in a perfect world, mid February. In a realistic world, probably towards the end of February. Um, in a in a bad scenario of like, oops, something happened. It'll be after February, but they'll be the new and improved. So I'll probably have to maybe I'll make a video or just in the live stream about some of the new features. They're the same basic thing. It's still, you know, great build quality, and, and they actually got a little quieter, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll do some teaching about it, probably. Mm. <laughs> I'm always scared my house is going to burn down with all the tanks and the power. Yeah, that's a valid concern. I, I fear it because I've got so many tanks and so many buildings that early on I said, well, and I, I learned, you know, I, I tell people I learned a lot from the, the company I worked for. I learned a lot of what not to do. And so like our store is taking forever to build, but we rewired the entire two spaces, right? So that they're safe for years to come because you just don't, um, you don't, you don't go back and you fix it and you don't want to use Oh, well, I'll just keep buying $27 GFI extension cord outlets and stuff. You you want to kind of design a system and and so yeah, I would I would say from the start just start trying to upgrade it and and you you'll run into all kinds of I wouldn't do that. Nobody does that. Like our old home that we sold, we had everything uh upgraded in the panel in the home even. So in the home but then also out in the fish room to be, uh, uh, what are they, arc fault interrupter breakers. And I was like, because at any moment I can have aquarium in any room in this house. And it just makes sense to protect everything. I have to live here. And you know, at the time, at the time, I was watching ballast get stupid hot with lights. I was watching, you know, I was I was seeing reviews of lights that, uh, you know, we were thinking about carrying and other influencers were, were using. And I wonder if I could find, let me see if I can find that picture. Let's see if I can find it. But it's stuff like that where you just, you start realizing like oh man okay I need to I need to take this seriously because it's 
while not impossible, it is a potential. I'm not seeing any pictures I can easily find. Um, but that's where we, you know, we upped our insurance on our home and not upped it. That's not the right thing. Made sure that it covered, you know, a, an aquarium accident and, and things like that. And, um, but yeah, I mean, part of my job is testing things. One, that we're having manufactured. Two, just stuff that's in the hobby. Like, hey, I haven't seen that yet. Let me play with it. Let me see if it's a good product. And not everything is made to the same standards. Some stuff, you know, that dollar twelve steak, you kind of know it's not not gonna do you well when you buy it, but you might want to see how it goes. So, and then from there you can learn. I'm moving to a small retail space February first. I sell plants and fish online and at swaps and auctions. Would it be a mistake to not open a local fish store to the public? No, not necessarily. Um, and the reason I say that is like maybe in the business world, maybe make, let's say you can sell $6,000 worth of stuff a month and you do that with taking care of the plants and running to the airport to pick them up and going to swaps and auctions and things, right? And right now you don't have to keep any store hours. Now. You open to the public, you got to be open at least five days a week minimum, and you probably got to be open eight hours a day. That's 40 hours that you will be open, and the assumption will be that you'll make money. But the reality is those 40 hours means you're not doing those other things. So you might actually have a loss. You might also make a lot more money. But what you'll find in practice and in testing and in studies like our store is going to get three times bigger. The If we're lucky, we're going to do about 5% more revenue. So 5% more revenue, it's going to cost us 30% more in employee wages because we have to staff more. We're going to spend at least double. It won't be triple because things don't scale that way, but at least double in utilities and things like that. And the build costs, you know, so it's like to build this thing, we might have spent... I don't know, over a hundred grand. And it's like at 5% more sales, isn't that going to take you years and years and years? Plus the added cost to recoup that? Like, yes. But we want to be able to film there. So we get a little bit more use out of that. We just need more room because we're going to start losing money if we don't make the store bigger. People don't like the long lines. They don't like uh, you know how crowded it is on the weekends. And so with your business... You know, maybe what you do is you 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 test the water. You could always say, "Hey, we're open on Saturdays," you know, and or 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 Mondays or whatever it's going to be, and and almost offer a in store pickup, right? So it's not it's not open, and I, I wouldn't do just like appointments either, because then you've got like, well, I've got an appointment tomorrow at three, then I have one the next day at nine a.m., and then I have one the next day at six thirty p.m. Like that just ends up kind of jamming your life up anyway. But if you allowed pick up oh yeah on Fridays you can come pick up what you order online that kind of stuff um, that might work out well for you but don't assume just because others are doing it you'll be good at it right you could be very good at growing plants selling online and emails and you could be terrible one-on-one -on -one in person with someone right you don't you don't know I mean you might know but I don't know that and uh, not everyone's good at that. And that's like my job, my company is really seeing what people are good at and trying to put them in roles they're good at. Because um, you might have, like I'll, I'll, I'll throw Candy under the bus here, which she'll love. Um, she's knowledgeable about her product. She knows a lot of things. She's a nice person and all of that. And to go back to a previous conversation, but she hasn't been trained in customer de-escalation in person, Right. Well, someone's really angry online, we know how to make them happier. But when they're really angry in person, how do you make them happier? When someone wants to sit down and have lunch and spend four hours at the store, how have you been trained to make sure that moves on and it's still profitable? And so not everyone's good at everything. And with training, people can get better at things. But, um, you know, is that a whole area of the business you want to add on to what you're doing? 
you know, just like, well, why don't you guys sell some more dog and cat stuff? Why don't you, why don't you do salt water? Why don't you do African cichlids? Why don't you, why don't you, why don't you? And the reality is because we're still not, we haven't perfected freshwater planted aquariums. We probably never will. I can dedicate the rest of my life and we'll just keep getting better and better and better and better. But to me, I look at it like it's an athlete. Let's say we're on a fairly good team and we're doing pretty good at our positions. Like, why don't you do the Michael Jordan? Like, yeah, you're really good at basketball. Why don't you start doing baseball and football and golf and ping pong and this and this and this and this? Like, even though he was a great athlete and, you know, his body was built to do a lot of things, he was never even close to as good at any of those other sports as he was basketball. And even he realized that, like, yep, I just got to focus on the thing and you get better at it, you dedicate it. You know, if everyone could do everything, we'd have a lot more companies like we have right now that are just buying up everything and uh, doing it worse. Have I tested Tropica plants? I have a few species and they're doing great. Uh, yeah. We were slated to be the first retailer of Tropica plants in the United States years ago. But... Um, Basically, what we determined was they were too expensive and, at the time, too hard to get. So, their plant facility is in Vancouver, and it's about two hours from us if I was to drive there. It took five days to get travel those two hours with customs and everything to get to me. So, the plants weren't doing so well, they were expensive, limited selection, and their prices keep going up. You've probably seen more and more people are bringing them on, but uh, the prices are are pretty expensive, and they're and and I don't know everything, but to my knowledge, they're the only plant provider that has a minimum a map pricing on plants, which is interesting. And what that means for people to know what map is, it means the minimum uh, the minimum advertised price. And so it might be like, oh, this Anubius, the minimum price that can be sold by anybody in the United States. That sells tropical plants is sixteen fifty nine, right? And that's a very difficult value proposition when, like, oh, but the average Anubius and like Nana Petite is ten to thirteen, right? So while they have a great reputation in Europe, um, I, in my opinion, they don't have that reputation here, and it's not at the same, not at the same scale and caliber because I've, I've visited the Tropica facilities in Germany multiple times. You, if you guys were watching me on uh, Chris Lukup's Facebook, we went there last time I was there. And and so it's it's not even close to the same thing. It would, it would kind of be like, it would be like me franchising. If I took the Aquarium Co-op name and I basically sold a franchise of it, ah, franchise might not be the right analogy, but let's say, Aquarium Co-op, and I didn't franchise it out, but I said, I'm opening a store in, uh, let's say, the UK, but I'll never visit it, and I'll just uh, keep telling people how it should be done. It's never going to be as good as a store that I'm actually overseeing. It just can't be. It doesn't mean that it won't be okay, but that's kind of what they've got going on in, you know, Tropica, North America, basically, is... Every company wants to be in North America because why not? It's one of the largest markets in the world. But being that most of all of their team is in a different country, it's not working out that well. So, and there's just things that, uh, you know, there, there are things that European companies never understand. They don't, most of them don't even know map can exist. They also don't realize like shipping is as big of a burden in America as it is because you can ship like the same, like I'll say I need to ship this water bottle in Europe. You're like, yeah, you can ship it anywhere in Europe and it's $3, right? And then you go to ship in America, you're like, oh, it's $12. What? They don't, they don't realize that. And so they don't see how that $16 Anubius is now going to be like $24, with shipping and oh you gotta use heat packs like what 
Europe's actually pretty condensed and small and, and, and works together, where America is real spread out. Uh, let's see. I'm an Aquarium Dietzenbach customer, and I would love you to tour them. Oh, uh, we, we've done it before. There's a video on Aquarium Dietzenbach on, on the channel. I go there every time I'm in, in Europe. I think I've been there four or five times. And good, good people, good people own that, uh, that wholesaler. In fact, a lot of videos you'll see on Chris Lukup and Oliver Knott's channel are actually filmed in that facility. In fact, I think today's video, um, from Oliver Knott on Instagram, where he's like getting a manicure by the, the really shrimp. Usually I would, I would put money that was, um, filmed at Dietzenbach. Those those guys go way back, like thirty years. So, mm, what time? One twenty-two. Okay, lost track of time. Just been talking. I've been wondering if your sponge filters come from the same factory as Sponge Daddies. I have no idea, but I hope not, because Sponge Daddies is like a terrible name. Let me see. Sponge Daddies. I guess I gotta put a sponge filter with that. I, I can only see Scrub Daddies. I don't see any. Hmm. I have no idea. I want to try a five gallon planter tank. What tips and advice can you give me on saving money? Uh, no one ever likes my answer. My answer is go mow your neighbor's lawn, make 20 bucks, and then spend that on your planted aquarium. There are plenty of ways to save money, but it's all at the cost of time. And too often, when the person that asks that question, they haven't experienced planter tanks and stuff enough yet and then they end up having to buy it two and three and four times so you know you might start out with like oh i'm going to start out with a dirted tank so i'm going to save some money i can dig that up out of my yard turns out it's got too much of this nutrient or i'm new to the hobby and i didn't realize ammonia was going to spike or i'm trying to save money so i bought two plants and didn't realize that um you know you need to fully plant that otherwise you're just going to always have ammonia problems and so my, my best advice, honestly, and this is the same, if you never buy anything from us, doesn't matter. Spend the time, go make some money. Mow your neighbor's lawn, do some yard work, work a couple hours overtime at work, like find a way to generate like an extra hundred bucks. And then buy the things that you think you're going to like in your aquarium. Be thrifty. Shop Amazon, check 10 different sellers online, like you don't need to overpay, all of those things, right? But I, I do believe this on a, on a decent amount of stuff. You get what you pay for, for a lot of the aquarium stuff. Read lots of reviews, right? Do all of that. But, uh, you know, I feel like without doing that, you're going to set up one tank and then you're instantly going to go, but I didn't set up this high-end planet tank. And then when you do that, but I didn't try doing this tank, but I didn't try doing this thing. And so, yeah, saving money. I guess when it comes to animals, I'm not big on saving money. I'm big on buying once, trying to do the right thing with the information you have at the time, knowing that you can't possibly know. And I find it easier for most people to source money from something they know to do well, whatever you go to work and do, right? And then use that money to learn the skill. All right. How's the ortho going? I got my, my latest wire put on, I think Thursday on the bottom. I'm, I've got this gap we're closing now. Right there. So once we close, we, 
once they close that gap, as I'm told, which is going to take like another, I don't know, like eight weeks, then they can, they, then they say it's on to micro adjustments where they just working on the bite a little bit, even though I have a good bite, they're like, Hey, part of our job is making it as perfect as possible. So then we'll move to however long that stage takes. What's my take on blackworm flake? I saw an ad the other day and haven't seen this product before. If there's a global shortage, how are we making new flake foods with the stuff we don't have? Well, that's a good question. I believe they make some black worms in Australia, and there's a few other places around the world. That being said, moving a live black worm around the world costs a lot of money. A freeze-dried version of that, very cheap because it's very light and dense right compact it's mostly the live blackworm shortages in america because i think there last time i looked into this was like eight years ago i believe there's only two farms that even produce blackworms in america and they've always had problems and that's why we stopped carrying them in the store we've sold insane amounts like we were bringing 30, 40, 50 pounds in a week. It, we were having multiple fridges and it was it was an ordeal. And they could almost like never keep up. And it was just one thing after another. Water shortage, fires, water shortage, fires, don't have enough staff, fires, water shortage, this, that. Like it's it's always gonna be that. And so that's where we we stopped selling it because too many people were letting their fish become dependent on that. And then they would get super angry when we couldn't provide them like we had to. And it's like, great, but we don't make them. And you can you can breed them very slow um, in your own like home setups, but it's very difficult. I've I've never been able to master it myself. It's not that I haven't made some more, it's that it never it never made any in a meaningful way and it was a pain to harvest them. So but in terms of black worm flake, I've tried a bunch and I've never had it where the fish went nuts for it. So it's not that they wouldn't eat it, but uh, it, it never performed better than like the extreme krill flake, for instance. Um, and there's other flakes that are good too. And But it, it held a higher price as well. And I like to hold everything to a high standard. And my my high standard is... And it, it's not 100%, but if the food in a dried form is more expensive than the frozen version, I don't like that, right? So, like, um, like a pound of a pound of blackworms, and you're buying a lot of them. You can get them down to like 20 bucks, and a pound of black worm flake might have been more than 20 bucks and it's like but how can that be i want and so my metric is a lot of times if a food is more expensive than having a variety of like frozen brine shrimp and blood worms and things like that then i don't put a whole lot of value into it there are exceptions because i still like to feed dry foods in addition to frozen but like yesterday, I fed frozen foods to, like the last three days, I fed frozen foods to like everything in my fish room. Today, I fed extreme uh, krill flake, and then the auto feeder is still feeding out the extreme nano pellet. Now, even though those cost more than the frozen, uh, one, it's, it's the mode of delivery. So auto feeder, I'm trading time for money. So that's an okay exchange for me. And then when I fed the flake food today, I fed the flake food because it floats longer. And so the things that I have in quarantine for like my fish room, like the glass cats and the um, oh, brain fart, silver hatchet fish, they want to feed off the surface. And so that's why I mix that in basically. And there's, there's a few like a few dry pellets. So specifically for like, um, the fly river turtle doesn't want as much protein, so he gets pellets as opposed to frozen. Now, I could do some more frozen if I really track that down, but I'm trying to keep it down to three or four different frozen foods that I keep. And so, yeah, when food, dry foods start becoming more expensive than the 
frozen foods, I really have to take a step back and go, is this better? And it, it can be sometimes, by the way. The blends of food can be better than a frozen food, but how much better, right? So when you start, look, I kind of look at it like if you start looking at it like, hey, I can order a steak for 20 bucks. Let's say it's, you know, steak and potato and some veggies, and you like that. Because I'm not really a big steak guy, but, and it's 20 bucks. When you start getting into like, oh, I can get a, a cheeseburger and it's 35 here. Why wouldn't I just get the steak? You know, like you got to really be in the mood for that hamburger. But sometimes you'll find like, wow, they really specialize in hamburgers and these hamburgers are amazing. Maybe it is worth that extra money. But when it comes to a fish room and a store and a warehouse, we have to look at it from dollars. If you only have two fish tanks, it doesn't matter. Feed whatever. Price kind of doesn't matter. Um, but when you start buying in massive bulk, that's when it does matter. And so, um, yeah, my take on freeze dried black worm flake, haven't found one I loved. Um, even the freeze dried black worms themselves, I haven't found one that I love. Dean's got one he likes okay, but they're stupid expensive, uh, out of Australia and they're coated in something to make them want to eat them more. But, uh, yeah. That being said, I'm going to look like a giant hypocrite probably in like a month when we, we launch our freeze-dried foods. And I'm all about freeze-dried, which I fed those too in this week. Um, so actually, the days I was feeding frozen to like uh, the glass cats and the platinum, are they platinum? They're silver hatchets. One day was me holding and... Uh, frozen cyclops to make sure it stayed in the water column and then the other two of the frozen days if you will were freeze-dried foods that we'll be releasing and they were uh, a brine trip one that i really like and then tube effects worms they get both each day and it's because they float for a long time and they allow those fish to eat for like an hour and then today was the flake um, so i realize you know everything what the internet's great at that everything in uh, in a vacuum could make me look stupid of like you just said this like of course there'll be a, I think there's another video from a clip when I said canvas filters are terrible which they I still believe canvas filters are terrible but out of context people are gonna lose their mind again and what I you know what I would tell people is like when you factor in how much they cost how long they take to service how often people neglect them and all of these things about cancer filters and you compare it to hang on back or a sponge filter, or an under gravel filter, or no filter at all, they are actually terrible. That doesn't mean that there's not, like, I, Corey, you use them. You're right. I do use them. Why? Because there's applications for everything, but not in the proportion that people are using them. So I would wager that most people in this chat own or have owned a canister filter. How many people actually needed those? Corey, when do you need them? Well, I'm only using them on... Uh, two tanks. Is that correct? Yes, two tanks. My 800 gallon, and I'll explain why. And my turtle tank, and I'll explain why. The, why are you running in the turtle tank, Corey? Because I'm afraid that my super rare fly river turtle will take bites out of a sponge filter and potentially get constipated and die. So I'm using a canister filter, even though I hate that thing. Why are you doing it in the 800 gallon, Corey? Well, let me tell you. The tank is so stupid deep, I can't reach the bottom. And when you have a sponge filter, or an under gravel filter, or a hang on back, which I, I tried. If you look at the top of the 800 gallon, I tried. I had enough slots to run eight AquaClear 110s. It wasn't good enough. I tried it first. Trust me. But I can't reach the sponge filter, so I gotta use the super long tongs. And you pull that up, and it just releases all the gunk. And I can't get a bag around it while using the tongs. So one of the reasons I hate servicing the 800-gallon is because they have stupid canister filters. Now, is it needed there? It completely is. Do I wish it was just sponge filters or anything else that's way easier to play with? I totally do. Um, but anyway, everything out of context. Yep, Corey said he only feeds frozen. Oh, he only does this, and then he's going to launch a freeze-dried food, and then everybody's going to be like, I thought... Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. Everything's got a use. Best burger I've ever had is Maui Beef Burger. 
I've had a really good Maui beef burger as well from, uh, what's that place called? Coconuts? No. What's that place called? That's where I had my jalapeno and spinach mashed potatoes that are to die for with fish there. We had it like four times water in Maui. I don't know. My wife will know if she's listening. Can you use flu ball soil for golden rams? Can you? Yes. Would I? No. Just because it'll make the water really soft, or not soft, but drop the pH a lot. When they're digging, it's light and fluffy. So can you? You totally can. Would I? Eh, I probably wouldn't, but I don't like the stuff to begin with. Will the Fritz salt I just bought be good enough for baby brine shrimp hatching, or should I get the brine shrimp salt? Um, the answer is both will hatch. I personally find I get a better hatch with our brine shrimp salt or, or pretty much any other marine salt. So like Fritz marine salt, like they've got, I don't know, I don't, I don't know what the craft's called. But, you know, there's all the salts like reef crystals and ocean, I want to say ocean nutrition, but that's whatever, whatever the other ocean salt is, any of those, yeah, Monkey Pod was the restaurant we went to, uh, any of those salts, basically uh, what I want is I want stuff that's going to buffer up the pH and add minerals and all of that. And part of the reason why I want that, because I'm a crazy madman that never knows what he's talking about and is on the internet, I like to add the salt to my aquariums. Oh my gosh, get get the pitchforks. We got to go after this guy. What a fool. He's adding salt to his tanks. They're freshwater tanks. Why would he do it? Turns out when you pull up like a fertilizer... And then you pull up uh, things that are in salt. You start going, huh, huh, both have manganese in it? Well, that, that's a little weird. Huh, huh, both have, both have this in it too? Huh. It's, it's almost as if plants want minerals as well. <laughs> okay, well, let me, let me get some cecum equilibrium and then some salt. These are, these are both, both minerals. What about this product over here called trace elements? Oh my, wait, the trace elements are in the salt too. Yeah. So I like to put the salt in there because it's tiny amounts and I do water changes from time to time. So between water changes, which would take minerals out of your water if you were putting the salt in, and plants use them to grow, that's good too, right? So... And we're talking about a two liter thing of, of salt and water. And I harvest my brine shrimp and I might have, I don't know, like this much of brine shrimp and salt. So this is 12 ounces right here. So they're right here. That's how I know. I'm a genius. So I might have 12 ounces of salt water. Well, it's not even salt water. It's brackish water. This is going to be divided over 6,000 gallons of water. It's barely going to make a big difference. And I might even go real heavy. I might go real heavy on those fry tanks and those and those guppy tanks. Because I know that the guppies and live bears want uh, extra minerals. So, so yes, uh, I like to use a marine salt. We made our own brackish brine shrimp salt. And, uh, yeah. But, you know, do what you want. Do what works for you. You might have a system where you're like, hey, I never change water. I get it. You might not have any live plants. I get it. But for me, works well. What about with an angel ram? Angel rams are just long pin versions of normal rams. How's Murphy? I heard he's just kind of doing same old, same old. Still eating out of the, the tongs and all that. At least when I checked up on Tuesday. I'll get another update tomorrow. Not tomorrow. Tomorrow's not Tuesday. Not yet. So when using salt as meds, is it better to use marine salt instead of plain salt that does not have the extra minerals? No. See, this is going to go down that whole salt rabbit hole. 
No. The difference between a tiny amount of salt distributed over like 6,000 gallons of water is way different than marine salt being dosed at the tablespoon per, per gallon or per three gallons. It's different. Uh, when using a medication, when using salt as a medication, for more, the easier way is to say just use normal NACL. If you want to get to, into an advanced thing, which I don't want to, so don't ask Aquarium Co-op because we don't want to deal with that. You could make your own salts or dose. Like let's say I was treating, let's say I had uh, guppies that I had imported and I paid $500 for and they were there doing the shimmies and I didn't have very hard, hard water. Part of the salt that I would use to fix them up would be marine salt because it would buffer the pH, it would buffer the KH, it would add calcium, it would add these minerals. If I just dose a ton of that though, it's just going to be salt water and that's going to be really hard on them. And so if you've seen, uh, if you Google things like uh, African cichlid salt recipes, you can read how to make your own salt levels for your aquariums. It uses five gallon buckets, you do a lot of testing, you figure out exactly my water structure plus these salts equals this result. And if I repeat that for every five gallons, I should get this desired outcome. Most people have a hard time with directions and they mix things up. Tablespoon to table, teaspoon to tablespoon. I did it differently this time. I thought it was this many gallons. And so that's why officially we don't want to do that because... Anytime I've tried to do that stuff in the past, people get lost. And uh, then you just hear horror stories of like, no, but you said put a, a cup of marine salt per gallon in my aquarium. Like, we've never said that. And then what, you you know, they'll, they'll link us a clip, and it'll be me saying that I will use a cup of salt per 20 gallons in the retail store that is not marine salt. It's a big difference. So, salt, difficult for people to get to the end of the rainbow on because it's it's a whole thing to learn, you know, and you start, mine will start being blown when, what's the difference between erythromycin and maricin? You get this giant jug of erythromycin and then maricin is only this big. The active ingredient in both of them is erythromycin. This one just has a ton of NaCl, which is salt, because I get more for my money. I get a bunch of salt that you don't need. It costs more to ship. It's worse for the environment because it's got a bigger package. But it sells more because if you put them both on a shelf, oh, look how much med I get over here. It's kind of like, uh, I don't know, concentrated form, basically. It would be like buying juice concentrate out of the freezer section, you know, where you add the water once you get home to the pitcher versus it in the bottle with already the water. And you're like, well, look, I get more for my money over here because this one's only this big. And it could make twice as much fruit punch. But that's the way the average uh, American shopper shops. <laughs> I shouldn't have brought up salt. That's right. I, I'm a little more disappointed that we went this long and not a single person used, used the salty meme. Like we have that icon. Didn't even get used. <laughs> One year coin, here I come. Month away. I feel like I have a dog hair like in my eyelashes. Like I keep seeing it. Wait, was it? Nope, it was my own eyelash. My own eyelash was hanging from my eyelash. Remember to smash that like button rather than your aquariums. That's right. We got 15 minutes left. What are we diving into? I'm trying to find a way to grow these house plants out of the top of my tank without raising my aquarium light. Well, have you tried it? The reason I ask is more, a lot of people will worry about something that might not exist. So they're going, well, plants need light and my light's low to the top. 
I better figure out a solution before I try it. And maybe you have, but most people don't. And they don't realize that like, well, yeah, you've got a light above. That's going to grow some. And you might have some light coming in from the window. And your light normally will cast some light off from bouncing from either the water top or I mean the, the water surface or a glass top. And so what I find is a lot of times plants don't need additional lighting until they're like a good foot above the aquarium. You got to get to at least there. Most times I find they'll they'll just start like expanding this way though because that's where the light is. Alrighty, Roo. Most house plants don't need light. Exactly. Most house plants, the reason they they became house plants, is they can survive in such low levels of light that they can be inside instead of having to be outside, and so. Our aquariums have a lot of light kind of in and around them in general, and uh, most people do okay. But there's there's times where you're like, I'm trying to get my peace lily to flower, and it's not quite getting enough light. There's There are differences between my, my plant is growing, my plant is flowering, things like that. Brenda says, thanks for talking about Hoka shoes. I got a pair, and I love them. I ordered two more pairs like two days ago. Because I, I'm only wearing hokas. It's uh, they just it's it's nice to be able to do like twelve hour days with Dean in the fish room, and then my feet not hurt at all. Like my back still might be a little tight or something like that, and we'll be tired. But it's really nice to not have feet hurt, which I've always had. I've got a long, I've got, like, I broke my foot in three places, one time in a mosh pit when I was younger, so that's always been a problem, and then I have uh, what's called Morton's toe, so instead of my, my big toe being the longest, the middle toe is the longest, and it's something like, how many, there's a big percentage of people have Morton's toe, what is it? Twenty-two percent of the population has Morton's toe. This is in contrast to sixty-nine percent of the population that has Egyptian foot. Of course, who didn't know that? And then let's see, which is categorized by the big toe being the longest. So, sixty-nine percent have the big toe being the longest. Twenty-two percent have the middle toe being the longest, with approximately nine percent of the population with the same length. Of the big toe and the center toe. Who knew? All right. My cat has Morton's toes. <laughs> didn't know that. Uh, didn't know it went cross species. Who knew? Hope your dogs are doing well. My dogs are doing great. They, uh, just this morning, it's been sunny in here, as you can tell a little bit, probably. I'm a little too red just because of the way the light hits me. But uh, it was sunny, so my wife put down a towel, and Tinky got to lay in the sun, which is Tinky lives to lay in the sun. She likes to lay there till she's so hot and panting and wanting to die, and then she does it some more. And so we have to go, hey, you got to get out of there. you got to, you know, you're getting way too hot. She loves it, though. I'm trying very hard to set up assorted colors of neocardina shrimp. Would you recommend trying to sell wholesale to someone? Honestly, if I was doing neos for a profit, I would try and sell to other hobbyists at like, depending on the strain of shrimp, I would probably, I would probably go for making them higher quality, super bulletproof at a nice size and just trying to sell in groups of like 10 or more at two bucks a piece or more. Yeah. Because some rare strains, like getting orange, or not orange, yellow with a neon stripe down the back, they don't really breed true. And so you're going to spend a lot, you know, you might charge like six bucks for those ones because you're going to have a lot that are just yellows. But yellow neons, right, in a really high quality grade would be worth six bucks. Um, whereas like a really good cherry shrimp, if I was going to take the time to drive to someone's house and pick it up and do all that, 10 for 20 sounds like a good, a good, good offering.
Uh oh. My wife hits knows I'm a sneakerhead and hit me with the what are these when I wear my Hoka shoes. Yeah. They're they're kind of comic comically like almost like clown shoes in that uh they're wide and the soles are about ten miles tall, but they feel so good you don't care. You don't care. At least I don't care. Just ordered a 30-inch co-op light and some other necessities. Hopefully my one-year coin comes in this order. I also got the green puffer hoodie to rep that merch. That's right. Thank you for your purchase. I ordered a 20-inch co-op light. Oh, no, now it's a co-op thingy. For my 10-gallon, what setting should I do for growing crips I'd say like three or four like from the bottom through like maybe four clicks oh 10 gallon which were maybe three clicks up part of that I really need to make this video part of that like what lighting setting you should use will depend on what colors the substrate how tall those crips are and what color the background is so like black substrate black background absorbs a lot of light you might use one click higher We grew, or I've got pothos growing underwater. It was growing underwater in the fish room. It was getting out of control. I just acclimated two strains of guppies into my fish room. Am I silly to still, oh wait, to feel this happy? No way. I bask in that happiness. It is the best retail therapy I feel like. Because, like, I think... It happens with fish like it happens with other pets. When you adopt a dog, well, I guess you can buy a dog too. I've only ever adopted. But when you get a dog, there's that emotional high of like, oh man, this thing is sweet. And look, it just did a thing and it's being funny and it's doing that thing. You get all that. Then you get like the 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 other emotional highs like, oh, I'm going to buy it a new collar and a new shirt to wear and new food and this and that. And so... Is it funny to you know feel that happy? No, I think that's exactly what we do with pets and why we like them. And so, you know, I'm I'm excited. I bought from one of our retail partners. I'm not saying which one yet, um, but I bought some cardinal shrimp, and I bought 36 of them. And it was expensive. And I've been looking for them, and I've been wanting them. And I, you know, you watch me set that tank up and wait, you know. And I, I'm trying to. Hopefully, you guys. Hopefully it's shown in the videos that like I set that tank up and failed once, setting up again, increasing the temperature, putting the crushed coral on this, and we're talking months that I've been working on this so that I have a better chance. And it's not just like, oh yeah, like two videos ago, you just set that tank up. It's like, no, no, this has been a month, months long project. And so I'm super stoked to finally be ordering cardinal shrimp so that like I posted in a little, like little mod group for the Facebook forum yesterday, I was like, look, I finally saw one of my three shrimp I bought when I was down in Oregon. It, it, I hadn't seen any in the last like three weeks. And I finally saw one again. So I was like, oh, they're still alive. Good. Because they're very reclusive shrimps. You need a lot of them. You got to have like 500 and you can see 50 of them. So I need to breed them. But no, I think it's normal. And I think it's very healthy to be that excited. And I find that if you're not that excited after buying it, you maybe shouldn't have had that purchase. Um, because it's something you have to take care of and, you know, you gotta be, you really gotta love that dog to go scoop up the poop and to go, oh my God, it's barfed on the couch and, oh man, there's hair everywhere. Oh man, there's all these like downsides to pets. And so the upside's gotta be really good because then it outweighs all of those other things. So. What can I put in my shrimp tank that will eat detritus worms? I usually use something like guppies. They're going to eat some baby shrimp and stuff like that too, but I let them get really, uh, you know, really get on top of it all, and then I'll move the guppies to a different tank, and then the breeding comes back on the... Well, the breeding never stops on the shrimp, but the babies start making it again. I remember you suggested a specific make of hokas, but I didn't write it down. Could I repeat it? Yes. they The ones that I love and I've tested, because I, I got that weird rain man brain thing that I got to test everything to my detriment. The Bondi 8s is what it is. 
Now, I've been so tempted to test... Oh, I did I did test two or three other ones. I returned them all because they were terrible. Well, not terrible, but, you know, they were not in the same league. And they, what I really hate about uh, shoe brands, like Hoka's, there's probably like... Let's say there's 12 different types of Hoka's or something. I hate when you're like, oh, I wear a size 11 in the Bondi 8. And then you're like, ooh, sweet, look at these. I want to try those. Let me order those in 11. And it fits like it's a six and a half. And you're just like, what is wrong with this company? Because I tried before I went to Hawaii. I was like, ooh, Bondi makes these really stupid looking uh, slides or sandals or whatever. And I was like, they do look stupid. But if they're that comfortable and I'm going to be walking up and down the beach and, you know, from like the condo or hotel thingy to the beach... I want I I want to be comfortable. Those things did not fit even close to the same. It was really disappointing to order three different ones and all of them just be huge misses. So the Bondi eights, and I, I've tested both the slip resistant and the normal ones. So they they are good. I have had a few people say they didn't like the Hocus, by the way. So don't don't think it's all, you know, unicorns and rainbows. But, uh, you know, to be fair, they don't like that they have to tie their shoes. Which, that'd be great. I, I do wish Hocus kind of had, like... Well, I, I tried their slip-on. That was, that was one of the other ones I read. I was like, oh, a slip-on version of Hoka. That's, like, even better. But the fit was terrible. It was not even close to the same. And I, I'm just not willing, and maybe I should be willing, like, to order five times to be like, oh, in this shoe, I need a size 14, apparently. In this one, I need an 8, and then this one, I need an 11. That's just, that's rough. Of course, you should be getting money <laughs> for Hoka's. I could. They have an affiliate program, but I chose not to. I already make money when I tell you guys about aquarium stuff, and I made a decision, because I thought about it. I was like, man, I really, really love this thing. And there's nothing better than talking about it and getting paid to talk about it. Because that's even better. Because that's like free hocus. But I was like, if I... You know, I thought about it. I was like, if I'm monetizing the shoes. And then pretty soon I'm like, you should buy this water bottle. And I get a cut of that. And then the aquarium stuff. I'm afraid the conversation will become... Corey only talks about these things to make money. And the reality is... I really think these shoes are amazing. And by not making any money you'll probably know I'm being truthful because it would be way better for me to tell you to go buy Easy Green and all of our other crap instead of wasting time while I'm at work talking about hokas. <laughs> so, uh, but I do know that if you buy hokas and your life has changed, you're going to be like, oh man, if he knows shoes, he might know fertilizer. Uh, let's see, there was a... Where did that go? Someone said they bought Hoka's, but they wore a little too fast. Mm, I don't know where it went. I'm like blind to it. But I could see that. I mean, mine haven't, mine are still wearing pretty good, but, you know, I'm not going for a, a jog every day. I mean, if you could tell, I'm not, not exactly hitting jogging every day. I will say the one thing I don't like, well, not don't like, they're not my favorite shoe to work out in. Because the, the soles and everything um, are so thick, they they make things like calf raises and uh, some of the the balance work on like BOSU balls and, and other stuff makes it more difficult, which I'm okay with the balancing being more difficult, but being that there's so much cushion with doing calf raises and and I, I'm my, my trainer makes me do them in a deficit, right? So it's not just like lift for the calf raise. It's you have to be on the step and let it go down and do the lift from there. And so once you're in that thing, all this foam makes it hard to keep the balance right to get that extra lift. So, um, yeah. But I, I do love that shoe for most things. I still work out in them, but I go back and forth between is this the perfect workout shoe or not. I definitely like it, uh, yeah, for most things. Are we going to speak about fish? Probably not. Do you want to talk about fish? I feel like a thousand videos and everybody's talking about fish. Ain't nobody talking about hocus. Nobody. 
Plus, we just went on for two hours, mostly talking about plants, I will say that, and meds and other things, but we go over the conversation goes, and uh, the conversation is over. It's two o'clock. We do two hours on a Sunday. We're changing water. Uh, I need to get Hoka's to make a, uh, like a water change shoe, do the collab, and uh, I don't know, I don't know what special feature it would have, but something good. I've got me some old man New Balances. I mean, I I was a guy that wore a lot of New Balance. In fact, my favorite workout shoes are a specific type of New Balance I stopped making. Real irritating. Real irritating. I have two pairs. They're getting real thin because I've been worn a ton. And I, I check New Balance probably once every three months. I tried to buy them on eBay and stuff because this is the perfect workout shoe. I love them. Really love them. Can't find any of them. And I, I hate when a shoe company takes like, oh, it's the New Balance 628s. And they come out with a 629 and it's like, it's an entirely different product. Like, you fools, you upgraded it, did you? You broke it. So yeah, I'm trust me, I'm all about comfort. I'm wearing Costco sweatpants and, uh, you know, a pretty comfy polo. And I like comfort, so... I was a New Balance guy. I mean, I wore some other stuff too. It was New Balance and, uh, oh, what's the Hawaiian brand? I was wearing those too. I still have them. I didn't get rid of them, but the Olukai Hawaiian inspired footwear. Like, there was a bunch too. Um, but, you know, my quest led me to the Hoka's and, Every time I got a choice, I pick the Hoka's. Drop some new merch. Are you joking me, Joshua? Drop two new things in the last 30 days. We can only invent stuff so fast. And not even that. It's like there's been, in the last 30 days, light launch, shirt launch, hoodie launch, two new member coin launch, uh, what else is like new that actually released? That might, well, it might only be five. That's more than one a week. I can only pedal the bike so fast. How oh, should I get Blackbeard off my crinum? Uh, get yourself some, uh, flagfish. That's what I would do. Holds up to it. <laughs> what is a new balance? Stop making those because Corey liked them. Don't get me started. My wife and I joke about that all the time. Everything I like. I, I I live in fear of that. So like the minute I like the hookahs, you buy two pairs. The minute I like anything, I instantly buy at least two. Because I've got this weird taste in everything in my life. Where I'm attracted to whatever other people don't want. I don't know why. And it's so irritating for me. Do a car license plate cover? We did some way back in the day. We also did ice scrapers. We've done luggage tags. We've done coasters. We've done little pins. Oh, we've done like three different pins. We've done, uh, what else was some? Oh, we did uh, drink koozies. We've done pens, a few different types of pens. We've done, what else have we done over the years? We've done a lot of stuff. We just haven't, uh, you know, can't do all the things all the time. Got to do some of the things some of the time. Will merch be sold at April's Aquarium? Depends if April's Aquariums buy them. That's up to them. I always buy multiples of clothes and shoes that I like as well. It's something that I've learned. It used to be, and I feel like this is changing. It used to be like, Oh, yeah, that's the pair of Levi's or whatever I like. Two years later, you're like, mm, these are getting pretty worn. Let me buy some more. And then you're like, well, what do you mean we've gotten rid of this or we've, we've made it better in a horrible way or whatever? And it seems like that's always what's happening to me. I don't know if COVID maybe like sourcing issues are a problem, but man, it's really just uh, really gotten out of control. So I uh, now I, I know, oh, I like this thing. I better order more because too many things in the world is 
is like limited runs. We did the floater boater keychain. That's another little merch thing we did. Floater boater right here. Got all kinds of stuff. Every once in a while, we really find something old where it's like, remember that we almost did? Like, I'm looking at, we got like aquarium co-op USB cables and different clothing things we've tried over the years. All right. I'm going to answer this last question, and then I'm going to get ready to go to Grandma's house. Ain't nobody messing with Grandma's house. Not even Aquashella, even though I want to go, I want to hang out with you guys. Nobody messing with Grandma's house. All right, the last question of the day. You ready? Tech Junkie 28 says, can you talk about dosing Marison for blue-green algae? You better believe I can. Blue-green algae is actually a bacteria, which is good because then you can use an antibiotic to kill said bacteria. I like to remove any of the big chunks I can find because sometimes they'll grow like a sheet and you can kind of Lift it off gravel or plants, maybe a plant leaf. You run your thumb and it comes off, net it out. Then I dose, I dose the rest of the tank with Marison or, right, slime out, either one. Basically an antibiotic. That kills it. Then what I do is I do normal aquarium stuff, you know, like take a bath in there, Make my grilled cheese sandwiches in there. The normal stuff. And then like a week or two later, I hit it up with some more antibiotic. Because I find most times, if I only ever hit it once, it'll be gone. And then when you least expect it, oh, here it is. And so when I hit it that second time a little bit down the road, I find that I can actually get rid of it. But usually there's a little nook and cranny right in the corner of that aquarium somewhere where the med didn't really get to that blue green algae and from there it's all it needs to come back so i like to get it that second time all right so now that you know how i make my grilled cheese sandwiches we will see you next time dollar 12 steaks